Yeah, a, a couple of years ago, Brent and I had a, uh, a letter uh, that we talked about. Uh, it was titled, Not Making Friends Today. So this is not too far off the track here. So th th this talk will be about really what's going on right now in the sector uh, based on something that's happened a little bit, uh, about three years. It's been happening for about three years. And now we're seeing the impacts of it. So, and there's a really good book called Six Extinction. I'm not trying to steal from them. Uh, so I encourage you to read it. So this talk is going to be about uh, the actual extinction event potential in the mining sector. We'll talk about what it was triggered by, and then the changes in the ecosystem and what you read about now what's happening, uh, specifically with the gold sector right now. And then what are the new species that are evolving from this event? So the Earth has witnessed about five mass extinction events. The biggest one that we all talk about is, is the dinosaurs. And that was the five extinction events happened from 540 million years ago when life began. Okay, And then the Triassic, uh, from that time, basically we had an increase of biodiversity. And when I show you um, the TSX listed stocks in the junior mining sector, you'll see that biodiversity in the mining sector as well. The last extinction event happened about 66 million years ago and marked the boundary between the Cretaceous and the tertiary. So if you look at the junior mining sector and take a snapshot right now, the number of issuers by industry, and so this is 2018, what's in the TSX, what's in the TSX venture by sector. And you can see that the mining sector dominates with respect to listings. And it's really not the main board that's the issue. It's the venture. There's almost a thousand companies listed on that. It's far more than any other sector. So it's quite the anomaly. And so the, the issue here right now is, are the funds available now to keep this going? <coughs> so the, the issue about listing on the TSX venture is it's not particularly egregious. Almost anybody could do it. So all you would need is $200,000 to fund a program within the next 12 months. You'd only need another 100,000, these are minimum numbers, of unallocated capital. You would only need 500,000 shares of free float. And you would only need an IPO listing of 10 cents. That's all you would need. Hence, we've got 900 odd companies uh, basically listed on the venture. The ability to serially tap the market is the big issue for these companies because they're not cash flowing. So right now the issue becomes the limited resources in this ecosystem. The mining sector of all these sectors that are listed on the venture and the main board, 65 to 70 percent of the transactions, financing transactions emanate from the mining sector. But the vast majority of those come from the venture. But the trend is global. It's not only a Canadian phenomenon. So if we take a time series from 2011 to 2018, and uh, this came out of a PDAC and Orin Inc. Uh, presentation that was just uh, released uh, this weekend uh, from, uh, from PDAC, I encourage you to go check it out. But basically, that trend has been happening since 2016 globally. The only difference between Canada and everybody else is we tend to fund more juniors uh, than globally. But in the end, those transactions that I showed you that the mining sector was leading, it, gets, it doesn't get the most amount of money. It's third. So in terms of uh, the cannabis or the life sciences, right now, that sector only had 200 financings and raised more total proceeds, 9 billion versus 6 billion. And so on the uh, main board, it raised more per transaction, 100 versus 20, and on the venture, it raised more, 13 million versus 3 versus the mining sector. So external shocks. So in that Cretaceous tertiary boundary, back in the 
80s, I believe it was, uh, this uh, father and son group, Alvarez, they found this Cretaceous tertiary layer that had a lot of iridium in it. And iridium is in common on Earth. And so that boundary was when they saw a distinct uh, decrease in a lot of uh, species. So that, was the, uh, that became this mass extinction event for the Cretaceous tertiary. And you could see what that line is and where they think that asteroid came down. And so that was an event. And so the event we have to deal with is this event in terms of uh, financing, especially in the gold sector. Like I've talked about this before uh, last year uh, in Vancouver, but the big issue is that there were $55 billion of assets under management around that uh, back in 2011. Over 90% of that was actively managed, meaning people were picking stocks, they were giving companies money. Fast forward to 2018, and um, you know, Van Eck is basically telling us the assets under management are now about 30 billion. But now it's not 95% of that is managed actively, now only a third of that is. So you went from having $50 billion of money being managed, entering the market, doing private placements, supporting companies, and now that number has gone down to 10. What has risen is the amount of passive funds, your GDXs and your GDXJs. And also, I believe um, last week it was announced, or it's a rumor, but the GDXJ is going to potentially stop investing in non-cash flowing companies. Because one thing that happened to the GDXJ during that part in uh, 2013 to 2015, it had invested in a lot of non-cash flowing companies that at that time had a billion dollar market cap, had the liquidity requirements it required. But then when the market went down, the liquidity went away and they ended up with stocks they couldn't sell. So in an effort to not go back there, I believe they're going to uh, keep um, investing in higher liquid companies. And investing, I mean just buying stock, not doing private placements or anything like that. So that's, that's another shift that we're going to see. But basically, that shrinkage over the last three years, active funds have gone down a billion, according to Van Eck. But encouragingly, passive funds have actually increased. So the generalists are interested in the sector. They're just not interested in investing in the same ways. And that phenomenon is reflected in the equity markets. So this is taken from a Macquarie slide uh, in a short course I did with a few friends in January during uh, the roundup. So you can see the total proceeds peaked about 2009, over $14 billion in 128 transactions. We still had 150 transactions in 2010, but then we had a steep decline. And then last year was the lowest amount of money raised in a decade about 2 billion and 35 transactions at 60 million. Note that these transactions, all of these transactions are over 10 million. We're not looking at any transactions below 10 million here. So you went from a peak where you raised $14 billion at 128 transactions, averaging over $100 million per transaction, to now where you're raising about 2 billion in 35 transactions and only about 60 million per average. And we could see that immediately in the brokerage industry. So the brokerage industry back in 2011, the bot deals, the brokered best efforts, that was about 5.5 billion raised. And the non-brokered placements were only 2.4. But during that 2013, 2015 period, when the brokerage industry basically took a holiday, companies had to go straight to their investors to get a placement. And so they basically went around the, uh, went around the brokerage industry. As the market changed in 2016, the institutions that still existed didn't want to pay the brokerage industry any more 6% because I knew the company anyway and they could just come directly to me. So now what we're seeing is a decline in broker best efforts as well as in bot deals. And, and in 2011, bot deals was seen as you know, a, a thumbs up for a company. Now it's seen as a liability because a lot of these bot deals aren't totally sold. So theoretically, you have a bot deal. Somebody bought your stock, but in a couple of months, they might dump it all, and it might be that same broker. 
So the changes in the ecosystem going forward in that mass extinction, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, we all know, especially if we got kids, that all the dinosaurs <laughs> were extinct. Another species were the uh, ammonites. With evolution, you know, comes opportunities for other species. And so what we got to ask ourselves is how is the mining industry going to adapt? And what are the new species that are going to evolve? And so what we're seeing now is the industry investing in the juniors. And so you could see, like I used to do this at Newmont, but not to this scale. You're seeing this big increase from 2016 to 2017 of industry getting directly involved in juniors. And one of it is it's a proxy for their own exploration. So you went from, it's about three and a half times right now to where it was before. What's nice for the company is that the, the industry does not really care about warrants. They don't really care about the premium. They're really concerned about whether you have a potential property that might make them a lot of money. It, making money in the shares is really what not, they're not about. So they offer you a premium to where you're trading, no warrant. So in terms of the company that's getting this, it, it's, it's a great boon. What we have been seeing is in Australia, Australia in that market that doesn't have to compete with cannabis, that didn't have to compete with Bitcoin, right next door to China, weak Australian dollar, just like in Canada. But those companies have done really well. They've executed really well on their plans. They've generated free cash flow, and now they're coming to the Americas. Geopolitically, they've had issues in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in PNG, what have you. Now they're trying to come to the Americas, but they're doing it. Cell 32 is investing in, uh, I mean, it bought the zinc project in, uh, in uh, Arizona. Newcrest has been very big all over the Americas. So that's another wave that's happening behind the industry. The other thing, in Canada, we have an advantage with flow-through financing. A large proportion of the financing for Canadian assets still comes from flow-through. And, and in that same PDAC presentation, what it's basically showing you is that the company gets $1,000, but the cost to the person is about $375. So that incentive is still going to be a boon for Canadian exploration. Private equity, that will take a bigger role. Okay, so we know about firms like Resource Capital, like Orion. Traditionally, it was late stage development assets, write the big check. Uh, but they're finding that some of these companies don't actually produce what they want to, and uh, you know, they end up having to own them. But also to take advantage of the paucity and expiration and the potential of these microcaps, RCF developed another fund a couple of years ago to do these little placements and to be much more versatile. So we could see more of these sort of funds going forward. The other thing is royalties and streamers. So the royalties and streaming companies don't generate their own royalties and streams, so they have to buy them. And so one way of buying them is financing these juniors. And so we should see more of that going forward. The other thing, I mean, we don't want to see junior explorers that aren't cash flowing doing debt, but for the junior producers, that is going to be something we'll be seeing a little bit more of, and hopefully at good terms. The other thing is consuming nations. So the Chinese uh, and other nations are coming in and investing directly in companies. And that's part of Barrick's big uh, joint venture with Shandong. It wasn't only a joint venture where they take 50% of Veladero. It was, hey, take a couple of hundred million dollars worth of my stock, and I'll take a couple of hundred million dollars worth of your stock. And so that's changing as well. And so with more offtake agreements, and you'll see that, you know, you've seen that in the lithium sector, you'll see that in the copper sector, but uh, they'll come and help you fund. This is interesting because this just happened last week. Um, so uh, this was Equinox. They um, basically cobbled together a bunch of assets, one in Brazil and a few in California. And, and they went to a sovereign wealth fund. 
And this sovereign wealth fund has about $225 billion of assets under management. And they purchased 130 million, like I think it's less than a half a percent of their whole AUM uh, on five-year converts with Equinox to help them fund their development of the Castle Mountain project. So as you're looking for juniors, you know, their savvy in terms of raising market has to be very good, and it's got to be eclectic now because there's so many different sources and so many more contacts you need. So we'll move on to the new species. So in terms of what we're seeing, and I talked about this uh, just recently at the, in, uh, in the Metal Investment Forum in Vancouver, is that because generalists prefer passive funds, they want the liquidity, they want the anonymity, they want the trading flexibility. In an attempt to stay relevant, the big companies are just getting bigger to compete directly against the ETFs. The difference is they issue dividends. So you got 26, and this was prior to Newmont making their deal with uh, Gold Corp and prior to Barrick making their deal with Rand Gold. I don't have Rand Gold here, but it would be around the uh, six billion-ish uh, market cap there. So basically, if you looked at these companies, there's 26 of these companies, and we we'll talk about relevance. Cumulative market cap of all these companies is about $100 billion. That's $20 billion in the market cap of BHP Billiton. Apple lost $450 billion in three months. So in terms of relevance, these big gold companies aren't very relevant. Their modus operandi going forward is to be relevant, to generate cash flow so you don't have to go back to the equity markets. You can raise debt but to make sure you can keep issuing dividends. So it's not about growth in the production profile, it's maintaining a stable pro, uh, production profile that generates free cash flow at 1250. That's the goal. So big is getting bigger, and so w the top slide is basically about what Barrick said, trying to convince people, oh, you know, we're gonna be the biggest. You know, we're gonna take over Rand Gold and we're gonna be huge will be all you'll need to know. And then what does Newmont come around? And then in January they say, no, no, it's us. Look at me. And now Barrick's come back this, this week and said, no, 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 look at me again. So these guys are definitely fighting for the generalist dollar because the generalist will only pick one, potentially. And, uh, you know, the issue with Barrick versus Newmont will be about where your assets are It, both of them are liquid. The ability to generate cash flow will be the important thing and the kind of dividends you could spew out, but sustainable. The other thing is what's going to be left over. So all these divestments, once these things close, will be a boon for the investment bankers, but also for the mid-tiers that are looking to grow. So for your potential development company, your single asset development company that's looking to get acquired. The issue is if, if it's not a real, I mean, if it's not like a couple of standard deviations with respect to the project quality, it might have to wait until this 18 months to two years of divestitures happen because all these companies are waiting to see what comes out of those mergers. And so the other thing is that the rise of the prospector uh, royalty generator model that we have a couple here uh, today. I mean, the whole idea is to maintain a relative tight share structure by not issuing a lot of shares. And that would be a boon in this market where there's not that many customers. And you'll be going straight to industry to do your joint venture. And the, the issue here is that there's two forms of dilution, not just one. There's the denominator that everybody likes to talk about, which is the share dilution, but there's also the project level dilution. What a prospect generator does is it takes it in the numerator and not the denominator. And when the denominator, the ability to actually raise money uh, becomes more problematic, uh, you know, this model might work going forward. But just having the model doesn't guarantee success. 
here's an example of what I would call success. So Reservoir Minerals was a prospect generator, but what they tended to do was they had a big land package, then they found something that they liked. They funded that. They funded that, raised $10 million at 65 cents. And if you kept your Nevshin shares, you would have received the equivalent of 2,000% return on that. If you'd exercised the warrants from the spin-out and the sale of Nevson, you might have made 4,000%. Okay, so that's, you know, the nirvana with respect to project generation. The key is to keep it under a tight share count. So in summary, you know, uh, we'd advocate there's probably too many uh, companies listed on the, the venture. Maybe it's time for quality over quantity. What's triggering this is a lot of that shift of assets under management from actively managed funds to passive. They buy on the market and they're not giving you private placements and not funding the market. What's going to replace that? I'm not sure if it's going to totally replace it, but we should see industry as we have been. We'll see private equity. We'll see royalties. We'll see streamers. We'll see more of uh, these Australians that are sitting there with a lot of free cash flow. Flow through shares will continue and potentially be more important. There'll be more debt for cash flowing uh, juniors. That'll be a higher proportion of how they get funded. You'll see sovereign wealth funds. You'll see offtake agreements. But all you're seeing is a menu of opportunities. And you just got to make sure the junior company that you're investing in knows this and has access to this. Because being capital market savvy means more than just knowing brokerage firms and knowing a few institutional equity buyers. And companies, like adapting right now, the mega mergers, that's to stay relevant. Because what they're competing now against the ETFs and what they're trying to gain is the generalist investor. The mid-tiers will talk about growth, but now their growth is now, I'm waiting for the divestitures to see what, because I'll get an operating asset. You know, there's lower execution risk. It's already run by a major. I could take it over. And that's part of the success that the Australians had taking over assets that the majors didn't want, running them better. So adapting for the, pros uh, for the juniors is not only going to be about being capital market savvy, but potentially adopting models like the prospect generator model. Okay, that's it for me.